Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for joining me for this podcast, and it is a distinct privilege to be with my friend John Sampson. If those of you who saw my interview with John that I posted a couple of weeks ago, uh, you might notice that we have a different arrangement. Uh, before I interviewed you on Zoom, and now I am in your living room. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? So John and I are together, and the reason that we're together is John has uh, graciously opened his pulpit to me this weekend. We're recording on a Saturday night, but Lord willing, tomorrow morning yes. I'll be preaching. Uh, John, you're the pastor of King's Church in Peoria, Arizona, right outside of Phoenix. And uh, so, John, thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure, it's a thrill, it's a delight, and uh, it's a privilege to be with you. Yeah, so well, good. Well, um, so we wanted to, since we were together, we thought, you know, we, have, we should just do a video together since we had this opportunity and flesh out a little bit more of some of the things that we talked about in our last interview. And uh, John, for those who may not have seen our previous interview, theologically, uh, we'll lay our cards on the table. You and I are both Calvinistic, to use that term, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about you, but I don't go around calling myself a Calvinist, because I'm not a disciple of John Calvin, but um, but you and I do believe in the biblical doctrine of election, and we're going to talk some more about that, and uh, God's sovereignty, and we are also cessationists, mm -hmm. but that's particularly poignant for you because you came from a Word of Faith background. Right? That's right, yeah. I was fully engaged as a pastor in the Word of Faith and uh, worked at TVN for a while. Yeah, and uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network, a Christian television operation, and uh, the Lord has delivered me and um, set free, and I uh, have no regrets of coming out of that into what I perceive to be the biblical truth. Amen. Yeah, indeed. And you have the distinct privilege of, uh, or uh, honor of having been fired by Jan Crouch. <laughs> I found out last week there was more than just Arizona. I think it was... Uh, at least, uh, at least two states I know of, but it might have been much more than that. She, oh, is that right? She just uh, fired everybody, bar a couple that I think stayed on, but it was it was uh, bigger than I thought. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, cessationism. A lot of people don't really understand what that term means, and when you, and I'll grant when you. When you use the term cessationist, we're kind of already starting behind the eight ball a little bit. It sounds it, negative, but you sounds deny negative. something. Yeah. Right, that yeah. we're denying something. We, that's all we're about is denying something. Yeah. yeah. So as a cessationist, do you deny the Holy Spirit? Not at the, all. The power of the Holy Spirit? Not at all. More full, full, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit more now than I did then. Amen. Amen. Isn't that the truth? And I tell people, it's all, uh, one of the great ironies in this whole movement is that uh, Word of Faith people, New Apostolic Reformation, they would look at people like us, John, and say, oh, you deny the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, even I've heard some say. And to the contrary, you and I have such a high view of the Holy yes. Spirit and uh, such a confidence in His power that we do not believe that someone can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit and teach the kind of jaw-dropping blasphemies and heresies that uh, that these people teach and and not have any conviction and, uh, and he, but even when you were in Word of Faith you didn't you didn't go nearly as far in your doctrine as as say like a Kenneth Copeland or a Benny Hinn or mm -hmm. even an Andrew Womack. You, I believe the Holy Spirit kept me, which is why I believe back then I was a genuine Christian. I, I would say um, with a heck of a lot of baggage for sure. Yeah. But uh, the Lord kept me from some of those blasphemies, which are, in fact, as a carefully phrased word, blasphemies yes. uh, of who Jesus is. The, the Holy Spirit would not allow that in the life of one of his right. people that yeah. he indwells. Yeah. But you, you teach the kind of things that Kenneth Copeland regularly teaches, and Creflo Dollar and Jesse Duplantis and Bill Johnson even, uh, they regularly teach just jaw-dropping heresies. And if they were truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit of God would be dropping them to their knees under such heavy conviction. Yeah, and the concern is when they hear 
truth, there's nothing in them that right. wants to change. That again it sends alarms, should send alarm bells to those who follow these people. Mm -hmm. That they don't say, you know what, I need to come under authority, the, the authority of the, the scriptures uh, and bear out what they teach and learn for a while. If in fact I've been guilty, I need to be open to the fact that I've been guilty of uh, teaching uh, either heresy or close to it. Yeah. And um, sadly, that's not always the case. In fact, it's very rare that someone yes. uh, listens to, to, to advice. Proverbs is all about you know, receiving correction. Indeed. And um, we should all be open to be corrected by the Word of God. Yeah, right. Indeed. And these are big things. These are not side issues when we're talking about Christology, who Jesus is. Truly God, truly man, never a time when he's not uh, functioning as the God-man after the incarnation. Right. He's, he's not uh, doing something only by, he, he, he's throwing out his divinity while he does something yes. over here. He, he, yeah. that, that, that's actual heresy. Absolutely. And they routinely teach that, that he laid his divinity aside. I mean, mm -hmm. Bill Johnson to this day teaches that. Todd White to this day teaches that. Um, Kenneth Copeland. So that's a, yeah, that's, that's heresy. We're not, we're not talking about the date of the Exodus or who wrote the book of Hebrews or mm -hmm. even eschatology. Yes. You know, not that eschatology is not important, but it's not a salvific issue. Right. And also as cessationists, you and I affirm that the gifts of teaching and mercy and administration, exhortation, giving, hospitality, those gifts are very much operative in the church today, right? Yes, for yeah. sure. So it's a it's a straw man argument. It's it's a red herring when people say, "Oh, cessationists don't believe in the gifts." Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we do actually. We just believe that the sign gifts have ceased, the mm -hmm. apostolic gifts. And uh, uh, I, I mentioned in our interview the the first time, the first installment, that even a lot of charismatics. Do not believe that there continue that there are still modern day apostles, big A apostles, and as mm -hmm. in holding that office mm -hmm. today. And and if you seed that, that okay, yeah, there's no more apostles today like Paul, mm -hmm. like Peter, you know, like John. Those there's no more apostles, big A apostles today. Then then you have already seeded the basic premise of the cessationist position that that gift. And it is a gift, Ephesians 4. He gave some as apostles. Then that gift has ceased. And so you've already seated the basic premise of cessationism. Yeah, the big A apostles had to have seen the risen Lord. And um, there were signs of the apostles, right. uh, 2 Corinthians 12. And yeah. um, those are not happening. Yeah, And I think even... the. Well, I don't know about every charismatic person, but most, I think, that are in any way sound would affirm the fact that those things are not happening, and they then redefine what is happening to be of that ilk, and it's not happening. Yes, no, uh, when not. Jesus healed them all, it was a unique thing in Israel, and though the apostles were able to reproduce... Um, Many of the things that Jesus did, they, there's no record that they turned water into wine. That's right. Uh, there's, there's no record of that because you read through John's Gospel, the seven signs that are brought out there, there were signs of the uniqueness of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if everyone can do them, then what makes that unique? He's just, uh, he was just the, the best skilled at what all of us can do. Which is exactly... What Bill Johnson, mm -hmm. when you say that, just rings. It's exactly what Bill Johnson teaches about mm -hmm. Christ. It says mm -hmm. he was the most, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but he says that um, if this isn't a direct quote, it's very, very close. Jesus Christ was the most normal Christian mm -hmm. in the Bible. Um, that's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't see any, the disciples, none of them walked on water. Mm -hmm. Peter did briefly, but only because Jesus commanded him to. Yes. But they didn't do that afterwards. And they couldn't do it at will. No. They, they couldn't just say, right, there's the Lake of Galilee. I'm going to walk over and uh, it'll save some time walking all of the way around. And um, they, they, 
people might say that's happening today. All right, well, the, the amazing thing is when they say all these miracles, the same things are happening as happened back then. Even in the darkest jungles of name the place, yeah. uh, there are cell phones. There are families that don't have uh, microwave ovens and don't have satellite television, but it seems everybody seems to have a, a cell phone, mm -hmm. even in those obscure uh, country places that uh, you can't even find on a map. Yeah. And so you'd think, wouldn't you, that if these things were happening as frequently as they say they are happening, someone somewhere would have yes. caught it. Yes. Would have, would have said, look, there's the video. And uh, there's this tribe that has never been reached before. There's this person, let's call her Betty Jones. She's gone out there from America. She's standing in the city square, the village square, the tribal square, and she goes off in tongues and everyone comes to Christ because they hear the gospel and you'd think someone what someone would have caught that right. because everybody's got this and even yeah, the person yeah. themselves would say hey take this for the next five minutes yeah and, and all we need is one that's yeah. genuine exactly um, show us yeah right I, I've been in some of the poorest countries on the planet mm -hmm. I've been in African countries where people are quite literally living in mud huts with thatched roofs. Yeah. And they have cell phones. Yes. I mean, it's, yes. it's all yes. hard to see, but it's true. Yes. And, um, you know, I tell people, if, if, if the apostolic gifts were still in operation, then charismatics would not have to expend so much energy and effort trying to convince us all that they are. It would be manifestly obvious that they are. Mm -hmm. But they're not. And the, the, it wasn't just the disciples of Christ that acknowledged the miracles of Jesus. It was the enemies of Christ. That's right. That's they right. couldn't deny that a miracle had happened. You read John's Gospel. Yeah. They yeah. couldn't. They couldn't. That's right. Even the enemies of the Gospel recognized that signs and wonders were taking place. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the evidence was just so overwhelming and incontrovertible. Uh, and that is not what we see today. I mean, what do we see? The best, the best we have today is Todd White going around on the streets, lengthening people's legs by about that much. Mm -hmm. and, and that that's a that's a parlor trick. Two signs and wonders. And apparently, there is an epidemic in this country of people with having one leg just a little bit shorter than the other. In every sense, I would say Todd White is as much a magician as he claims to be a man of God. I would go around and look for people that were like limping with obvious sicknesses. Is there any problems at all physically? Uh, my back isn't the best. And I'd go up to them and ask to pray for them. They tell your legs shorter, your one leg shorter than the other one, and it throws you back out. So this is the Holy Ghost film from 2014. This is a really great trick, and you're gonna see in a moment here that it is a trick. So what I'll do, regardless of what you believe, I'm gonna pray for you, and Jesus is gonna grow your leg out and heal your back. Charlatans and snake oil salesmen have been doing this trick for decades. It's sleight of hand. So Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Left leg, I command you grow right now. Jesus' name. Look at it, you see it? Whoa. Look at that. Do you guys see that right there? Yes. <laughs> it's longer now than the other one. And then if I was done, if they received it well, most did I'd be like oh God loves you so much have a good day I'm not like out here to say you need to no dude God loves you bro and that's it man December 5 man. now we're gonna see Todd White's clip sped up quite a bit and looped back and forth now this is where we can see what's really going on here the leg on our right is supposed to be the short leg and this is the leg which should be miraculously growing but it's not Look at the leg on our left. That's where all the action is. That's what's actually being manipulated. You can see that Todd is actually pivoting or shifting the foot of the so-called long leg so that the heels match. Now, he's doing this very slowly over time, but it's painfully obvious when you speed up the clip. And what he is doing is the most hateful thing you could possibly do for someone. Men like Todd White preach a gospel that is centered on love. The problem is it's not biblical love. Biblical love confronts sin. Would you see too that 
you read the book of Acts and there were some amazing things happening through the hands of the apostles, it says. Mm -hmm. And Peter's shadow causing people to be healed. Um, and yet, Acts, Acts 19 speaks of handkerchiefs from Paul going out. But as time goes on, you see a, once the gospel has been established, and that's the key thing, once the gospel has been established, when Paul has someone in front of him who's sick, he's, he's not just, or someone outside of his immediate 10 yard circle, he's not sending handkerchiefs. He, he's, he's talking about, I, I left someone sick. Yeah, Trophimus. In a, Trophimus yeah. at Miletus. And um, Timothy, Timothy yeah. take yeah. something for your stomach issues. Right. Rather than. Um, confess the word and um, yeah, uh, here's a handkerchief. Yeah. Um, and you, you see this waning of the apostolic power as the gospel was being established. Yeah. And uh, Galatians 4, Paul himself spoke of, uh, wrote of bodily affliction that he endured. And, right. and so take the script, we believe the scripture, we believe the Holy Spirit has, has God, he, he has breathed out the scripture for us and the scriptures themselves speak of this as, as a waning thing. It's obvious over time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, could you imagine if John was, you know, flowing in the same power that he started out with? I, I don't know. It, 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 there was a time when the miraculous was never now was not now the expectation. Yeah, right. That's right. And, and that's what that's all we're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, does God answer prayer? Absolutely. Do we see the the Lord in mercy? Um, we we see someone got ha, has received the, the cancer report, and recently we've seen times where folk have uh, have, not, uh, have had a, a retest, and it's no longer there. I have no doubt that God's been behind that. Mm -hmm. But you can't have that expectation. I don't think biblically you can have that expectation because um, it, it's clear that God is sovereign, and we'll talk about those scriptures, and God is sovereign over when people receive, and for many with, with absolutely atrocious handicaps and physical disabilities, their healing won't be in this world. Uh, and to, which gets us to the harshness of the word of faith, because there is no room for a sick person that no. is continually sick, who over three or four years is still sick, who after 10 years is still in that d disabled condition, that they, they are doing something wrong or not appropriating, to use probably their words that you, they use, but Jesus didn't have anybody in the crowd saying, could you help me appro appropriate this? They were all healed. Yes, that's right. And, and so to, to say we're walking in the same power as the apostles or Jesus, all right, show me a crowd where all are healed. And we're talking about very, very, very sick people. Yes. Very, very handicapped, blind, deaf, not slight slight issue that they, 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 the vision is a little fuzzy. This, this is blind from birth stuff. Yes. Yes. Show you're, us. You're refutable. Show us. Yep. And, and the enemies of Christ acknowledge the miracles. That's right. They put it as demonic and they, they, they said this is of the devil, but they couldn't deny the reality of it. That's exactly right. Yep. And I can deny the reality of Todd White lengthening someone's leg by half an inch. That's part of the truth. I could not, had I been living 2,000 years ago, denied that Jesus raised the dead. Mm -hmm. I couldn't deny that the apostles, that God, mm -hmm. through the apostles, raised the dead. Eutychus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you couldn't deny that. Yes. But it's it's quite easy to deny the, what we see being passed off as so-called signs and wonders today. Yeah. And um, and you're, you spoke just a minute ago about the cruelty of the Word of Faith movement. Just uh, earlier this year... I, I believe it was in January, I don't have the date, but uh, one of the more well-known names in the Word of Faith movement, quote-unquote, Apostle Frederick Casey Price died. 
And Fred Price had some of the cruelest statements that I have ever heard come from the mouth of a so-called preacher. And uh, he, he actually said, I, again, I'll have a quote in front of me, but he, he said, what makes you think that the Holy Spirit of God wants to live inside of a body that doesn't function right? In fact, I wanted to find the exact quote just so you can see for yourself how cruel the theology of the word faith movement really is. This is a thumbnail from a video that is on on YouTube done by a, a very pro word of faith YouTube um, channel. And I'm not even going to name it because I don't want to drive any traffic his direction. But shortly after Fred Price's death, this uh, YouTube channel did a very laudatory uh, review of Fred Price's ministry, just praising the socks off of this guy. Well, let me show you who this guy is. Here's, here's the quote. Fred Price says, How can you glorify God in your body when it doesn't function right? How can you glorify God? How can he get glory when your body doesn't even work? What makes you think the Holy Ghost wants to live inside of a body where he can't see out through the windows and he can't hear with the ears? What makes you think the Holy Spirit wants to live inside of a physical body where the limbs and the organs and the cells do not function right? And what makes you think he wants to live in a temple where he can't see out of the eyes, can't walk with the feet, and can't move with the hand? The only eyes that he has that are in the earth realm are the eyes that are in the body, which is just horrific theology in and of itself, but I digress. If he can't see out of them, then God's going to be limited. There's Fred Price. That is cruelty hmm. on a level that is I cannot even comprehend. That's what I mean when I say it's a legalistic religion. Because, yeah. because we're not talking about salvation, but we're talking about something pretty serious when we talk about people dying. And for someone to die in the word of faith thinking with a disease, they didn't, they weren't able to appropriate because of something they didn't do or something they did. It comes down to that because God has done all that he's going to do. He's the one who's got the power supply. It's always turned on. You somewhere have not appropriated. So you die because of you. Yeah, that's right. That's and your kid died because of you. Yeah. That's and, right. and so you're on. We're talking about real people. And as a pastor, I, I, I do wince about the doctrine that I espouse, even though I said I avoided some of the, the blatant heresies. To put simply healing in front of someone when they've got cancer, not prepare them to die, is not serving them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I've been guilty of. And, and I've talked with you, I, I said that the regret uh, uh, is, is enormous, and yet the forgiveness of God is there, I believe. But yeah. um, I, I want to establish the fact that God is... God is the healer, but he's also sovereign. We don't forget when we talk about his attributes, what we learn on page one of our Bibles, that God is the creator and the sustainer and the sovereign one, and he's sovereign over all things. And the fact that we even have to talk about it uh, is it, it's, it's sad in, in the Christian world, that God is sovereign and have to define it. And where do we go when we define sovereignty? Well, what we don't do is go to an English dictionary. Yeah. Uh, and and look up the word sovereign. We are to derive what we believe about sovereignty from from this book, That's right. and draw out what it says. And you can't read the book without finding out God is in control of all things. Let let's 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 talk about that. Any event on planet Earth, say there's going to be a bank robbery in a certain city next Tuesday. This is a fictitious idea, but let let's just go in our minds. In a certain city, a, a bank robbery is planned for, for on a Tuesday. Could God stop that? Yes. Yes, he could. Yes. I think every Christian would say, yes, he could. He could um, cause the, the car to not function that day, the getaway car, it never even got to the bank. He can, he can actually cause the bank robbers, plural, to have heart attacks before they ever get there. Yeah. In him we live and move and have our being. That's the God of the Bible. He, I can't raise my hand without God. That's the biblical teaching. That's right. I couldn't do that by myself without God allowing it. You're saying God allowed it? Yes. Yeah. 
God could stop me from raising my hand sure. by striking me down. He yeah. could. He's that God. And God is empowering me to do it. And God is empowering the atheist to have his brain cells function even as he defies God. Yeah. That's how sovereign he is. That's right. And so could God stop something? Yes. Could God stop anything? Yes. The fact that he allows something to take place means that in some way he's ordained it. That's right. There's no, the, the, where, where am I, where is the Christian, what can the Christian who doesn't believe this basic doctrine of sovereignty, where can he go, where, where are we going wrong here? If he can stop any event, which he can't. Remember in the Old Testament, there was, there was someone who's going to uh, take Abraham's wife and um, an appearance came to him uh, and God stopped him. He says, I've kept you from sinning. So he stopped the sin. Mm -hmm. People say, well, this thing, what about free will? Well, t let's talk about free will. How much free will did Nebuchadnezzar have after he got the Lord's Prayer wrong, it was centuries in advance, when he says, mine is the power, yeah. the kingdom, the glory. And, and God, you know what God didn't do? Was uh, come to him in, uh, in a vision and say, look, I know I, I, I'm a gentleman. Uh, I'll never violate free will. So I have to have your cooperation. I need you to sign on the line that you'll allow me to make you insane for a while. Right. You need, can you fill out this form? Because um, I would never violate your free will. Right. I can't. Yeah. I've given you free will. Yeah. Show me in the Bible where it says man can do anything he wants. Someone came back to me and says, uh, well, the Bible speaks of free will offerings. No, that, that, that's... <laughs> no, no. God is in the heavens, he does all he pleases. The Bible never says man is on the earth, he does all he pleases. Many of the plans in a man's heart, it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. We're only going to walk out of this room if God allows it. Yeah. And if God allowed it, he ordained it. Yeah, that's right. We don't know what he's ordained. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. In fact, the scripture tells us God does. Yeah. And we're working out in time what he has purposed in eternity. So... When it comes to, I want you to jump in, but when it comes to um, the ordination of all things, let's go right to the heart of it. The big issue is an emotional one for, for many. They say, well, if God has ordained everything, think that through. That means God ordains who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, and they reject that out of an emotion. But do you know the Bible speaks of it? Mm -hmm. The word predestination is a biblical word. Absolutely it is. And God has elected a people. Okay, Let, let's break it down. Let's say there's someone called Philip P. Barnes. This is just, again, made-up name. Before God creates the world, does he know that Philip P. Barnes will exist? Yes. Yes, he does. Does he know what kind of life he will have? Yes. Yes. Does he know whether he'll hear the gospel or not? Yes. Yes. Does he know whether he'll respond to the gospel or not. He does. He knows this before... Before the foundation of the before world. Before the foundation of the world. Why? Because all Christians believe in God's exhaustive knowledge of the future. Mm -hmm. There's nothing God is learning. That's right. He's not confused about the invention of computers and now has to react. That would be the heresy of open theism yes. that you're describing. Yes. Yeah. Um, the open theist, it's the idea that because it's not yet reality, God doesn't know of it. But God knows the end from the beginning. The Bible says, yep. before there's a beginning, God knows the end. Mm -hmm. So God knows the end of Philip P. Barnes. He knows before Genesis 1 and says, let there be light. He knows that there will be a Philip P. Barnes. He knows whether or not he'll hear the gospel, how many times he'll hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. He knows, despite all of his wooing of that person, whether or not he'll come to Christ or not. Right. And he goes ahead and creates. Now, does he create, knowing that Philip P. Barnes will exist, 
Does he know where Philip P. Barnes will go, heaven or hell? Yes. Yes, he does. And so this is not even a, a Calvinist, Arminian, monogist, synergist debate. This is just an orthodox view of God. Mm -hmm. To say that God knows everything, he's omniscient, he knows all things past, present, and future. For him to create Philip P. Barnes, knowing that he will, despite all of his efforts, even from the Arminian perspective, despite all of his efforts, Philip P. Barnes is actually going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. And he creates him anyway. He creates him anyway. So just throwing this thing out at the reformed world and say, you, you believe in someone who, a God who, who, who creates people knowing they're going to hell. As a Christian, if you believe in the exhaustive knowledge of God, you believe that too. Yeah, that's right. That's and that's what they don't face. And yeah. so all Christians believe, I've not said anything controversial yet. Right, that's right. And the, the Arminians, they, they would look at us as Calvinists, to use that term, but simply we believe in the biblical doctrine of election. That... Um, Oh, that, that makes God unfair. That makes him, I've even heard some, and I, it, I can hardly even quote this, much less teach it, but uh, some have said uh, the God of Calvinism that makes God out into a monster, mm -hmm. which is horrific. But um, they would look at us and say, that's not fair, that uh, you know God would not even give someone a chance. And that's so you're, this Calvinism is mean, it's hateful, it's, it's an angry God, and, it, and it, it's, he's unjust. That God would be un the Calvinist God would be unjust. Well, laying aside that horrific reasoning for a moment, the Arminians have the same problem that they accuse us of having. Because as you were just describing, the Arminian position, all they're doing is kicking the can down the road yes. a few years, a few decades, maybe, a right. lifespan, whatever that is. Right. They're kicking the can down. It would be better for Philip P. Barnes, if God knew that he was never going to accept Jesus and go to hell, it would be a better and more kind of God from the Arminian perspective to never have created him in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, those Arminian critics out there, you've got the same problem. They have the same problem. You've got the same problem. Even Jesus said of Judas, you know, of one who would betray him, it would have been better for him to have never been born. Mm -hmm. There's there's mystery in this, but this is where we place the mystery, where God has not revealed something. Secret things do belong to the Lord our God, yep. and the things revealed belong to us. I'm responsible for what he's revealed, not for what he hasn't revealed. And God never takes time to spend a chapter and say, John, I know you've got this question. Let me explain how divine sovereignty and human responsibility work uh, so uh, you know it satisfies you intellectually. You, you see both of those concepts sometimes in the same passage, in, in the same yes, verse, yes. Where, where man is entirely responsible and God is absolutely sovereign. Yes. And, and you, you see Jesus rejoicing in the doctrine of election. He, he says, I praise you, Father, you've hidden these things from the wise and, and the, the mighty and you've revealed them to bait. I remember seeing... Seeing that scripture, Jesus is actually rejoicing about the activity of God hiding something. When God hides something, you're not going to find it. That's, it. That's right. That's and right. Jesus rejoices. And I thought, I've got an intellectual and an emotional problem with it. And Jesus rejoices in it. What is he seeing that I'm not seeing? And you keep reading. And in the same passage, he says, I thank you, Father, you've hidden these things. From these guys, they're not going to find it. But you revealed it to, to, to babes. And then he says, come to me all yeah. who are weary and yeah. heavy laden. I'll give you. So Jesus, in acknowledging and rejoicing in sovereignty and election, then says, hear the gospel, call everyone. Yeah. He, and that's the objection. If God is sovereign, why evangelism? Yeah. Well, Jesus saw no contradiction. God is sovereign, and he knows who's going to respond, and he's ordained who's going to respond, and the means by which they respond is the preaching of the gospel, and you see it in the lips of Jesus. Yeah, 
And in that same passage, Matthew 13, you're right. It, he, he burst forth into this praise of God for hiding things. And, and he says, no one knows the Son except the Father. And the Father except the Son, except the one to whom he wills to reveal him. He chooses to reveal him one person. So that's, yeah. that's clearly election. Yes. I mean, you can't, you can't do enough hermeneutical gymnastics to get around that. Yeah. And then, as you were just saying, in the very next breath, yes, come to me. Yeah, and there's no, there's no next verse. Now, let me explain all this. It yeah. just states it. Just states. It. And so, what we have to do as Christians is, rather than say, "Well, I think uh, this and I think that," and the English, you know, definition in a dictionary is this. No, go to Daniel four. See, see God's mm -hmm. sovereignty in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar, and God. In hearing the blasphemous cry of this hum human in defiance of God, I own everything, to me be the glory. He says, all right, um, I choose with my free will that you be insane. You walk around the palace grounds looking like a grazing cow. Yeah, right. That's God's judgment. And again, he didn't have to get permission. Yeah. And you look at the will of man and the will of nations and... That's a whole lot of free will. You read Psalm 2, God laughs at the free will of man yep. because he ha he's the only one who ha has free will. And here's, here's the thing about choice. We always choose, Jonathan Edwards brought this out from, from Scripture, but it's a, it's a great insight. We always choose according to our strongest desire at the moment of choice. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're insane. Yeah. Why did I just do that? Because I most wanted to do that rather than that. Right, right, and and that's why we have a criminal court system. Okay, you did something. You can't just say, "Look, um, I I made the choice to shoot people, but it had nothing to do with me." Yeah, right. We choose according our desire, and we are responsible for our choices. Yep. And so, why did you choose Christ? And the biblical answer is not because you worked out somehow who Jesus was by your own self. But God opened your eyes. That's right. God saw, you might have heard the gospel for the first time or the 38th time, but God says, this is the day I open your eyes. And you see the beauty of Christ. And he was bringing you home that day because right. you were one of his sheep from the all eternity. The shepherd yes. calling the sheep, which, by the way, is the real meaning of John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. Yes. That's not talking about God telling you where to go to have lunch one day. That's, that's the effectual call. Of the yes, gospel. yes. And so why are you in the kingdom and your neighbor is not? It's, it, it's, it's, it's only because, three-letter word, God. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. If think about the thief on the cross. And what an immense... <laughs> I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you, were, you, were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What? What do you mean you don't know? Well, because I, I don't know. Well, you know, we're, uh, uh, did you, the, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Did you go get the supervisor, Ranger? 
so we're just a few questions for you. First of all, are you are you are you are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, "I never heard of it in my life." And and what about? Uh, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually, in frustration, he says, "On on what basis are you here?" And he said, "The man on the middle cross said, I can come." Yeah. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit moving where he wills, which is John 3. In the context of John 3.16, Jesus has made it clear the only way to be in the kingdom of God is you're born again first, regeneration. God uh, takes out the heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh that beats now to know Christ. And um, he's talking to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit. You think with Nicodemus saying, okay, well, how can this be entering into the womb again? How, tell, me, tell me the eight steps I need to do. Right. And Jesus gets even more mysterious uh -huh. and says, the wind blows where it wishes. Yeah. Yeah. Hear the sound, you don't know where it comes from. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. It's God's activity and God's activity alone that creates the Christian. Yep. So that one day I didn't want Christ and eight minutes later I did. That's right. That's right. It wasn't my wits, or else you've now got, if that's not the case, you've got something to boast about. Absolutely. I know Armenians often accuse Calvinists of being arrogant, but, you know, a, an arrogant Calvinist should be, granted, it's not always true, but it should be a contradiction in terms Absolutely. because um, I would posit that the Armenian perspective is what is arrogant because from the Armenian perspective I am smarter and wiser and a better person for choosing Jesus than Philip P. Barnes mm -hmm. because I had enough sense to choose Jesus when Philip P. Barnes did not. Because he got the same measure of grace that I did mm -hmm. and therefore if that's the belief the reason Philip P. Barnes is not in heaven and you are is because of something good in you. In me. But as Calvinists, we understand that there is nothing, nothing. Good in us. We're not, before Christ, we're not spiritually sick. We're not in the spiritual ICU. We're in the spiritual morgue. We're tag on the toe dead. Yes. And the Bible speaks of not just having a problem with hearing, but you cannot hear. We take those words, yes. we, we take those words seriously. Why can you not hear my words? It's because you're not my sheep. Jesus said that to people right in front of him. Yep. John 2. Yep. And we take those words serious. Blind. That, that's not just short-sighted. You know, it doesn't help someone uh, we were talking uh, earlier today about the difference between England and America. And in England, we say torch. In America, we say flashlight. Yeah. You know, a flashlight, a torch doesn't help a blind person. That's right. That's right. They need more than a torch and a flashlight. They need new eyes. Yeah. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And we take that seriously. We believe the Bible actually means what it says that we're blind to the beauty of Christ. And in context, that's what 2 Corinthians 4 is all about. See the glory of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason we find glory in the person of Christ is because God has opened up our eyes. And um, the Amazing yeah. Grace song was born out of that understanding, was blind, but now I see. Yeah, yeah it's the, the biblical doctrine of election is, should be the most humbling. Yes doctrine that there is because we understand that there's no nothing there's nothing better in Justin Peters or John Sampson than Philip E. Barnes that's or right. anybody else. That's right. That we're not better, we're not wiser, we're not smarter. It it strips from man all of the credit and that's the thing, is that men and women want to have something to do with their salvation. That's yes. just, they want to have something to do with it. But biblically, we understand we have nothing to do with it. Any, we can take no more credit in our conversion 
then Lazarus could take credit in Jesus bringing, calling him out of the tomb. And it's always been this way. Israel wasn't better than the other nations. And we right. call them the chosen people. And we don't think, um, well, couldn't he just wait around for the English to arrive? And, and uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah um, no. You, you read Deuteronomy 6. It's not because you are this or that. Or, it's because I, cho I set my love on you. It pleased God to do it. Yes. That. Yes. And so the big question is why Israel? Why the elect? Why me? And I cannot find any reason biblically or internally as to anything in me that he says, I like that about you. No, I was a defying rebel. And there was nothing in me that wanted. I remember, I talked about it last time, there was nothing in me that wanted the Bible or the God of the Bible. And now I love the Bible and the God of the Bible. What, what has changed? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, going back to... Theologians sometimes use the term concurrence. The, yes. The doctrine of God's sovereignty is clearly taught. You can't get around it. And so is the responsibility and accountability of man. We, we talked about Matthew 13. Mm -hmm. And um, and I also, also want to read Acts chapter 2. This is Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. And, and we'll just, for time's sake, we'll read verse 23. This is Peter speaking, preaching, and he says, This man, of course referring to Christ, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Literally in the same breath, in yes. the same sense. Why was Jesus crucified? Because he was he was crucified because it was the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And he was put to death, he was nailed to a cross at the hands of godless men, evil men. They did it. So yeah. was Jesus crucified because it was a predetermined plan of God? Yes. Was Jesus crucified because evil men put him to death? Yes. yes. And, and there's not this next section. Let me explain that. Yeah, it's just it's just there. there. It's and, just that's, there. and that's what we have to believe. It's not that we can fully wrap our minds around. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't, I can't wrap my mind around how God, from before the foundation of the world, from eternity past, chose a people for himself. Read John chapter 17. Read the high priestly prayer. I don't know how you get around election. Just in John 17. Absolutely. I've just preached on it recently. We're preaching through the, the Gospel of John, and, and um, it's, it's fathomless, but oh, it, no. it, yeah. it, it's, it, it's almost redundant. He just keeps repeating. And he, mm -hmm. again, he keeps rejoicing in this thing that people oppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but it, is, it is entirely amazing that God is sovereign, and there's a whole lot of free will to use that phrase, mm -hmm. that was extended to people to do what they wanted to do in the crucifixion of Christ, and God planned it. Yeah. And God planned and it. And God planned it. That's right. You know, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility and accountability of man, they're both taught. Scripture teaches both. Yes. And we believe both. Why? Because Scripture teaches We don't... Say I prefer one over the other. That's right. Either, as biblical Christians, we should say I, I, I'm not quite sure how to put these two together. Which is what concurrence says. It's the the sovereignty of God and the um, responsible responsibility of man concur. They happen at the same time in the same event. Yeah. But 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 your point and the biblical point is. It's there in Scripture staring us in the, in the face on, in, in so many ways. You, you think of the rolling of the dice, you know, at, a, at, at some casino. Scripture says, Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from Yahweh, from the Lord. So God is involved. Well, well God is not involved in everything. That's the Old Testament way of saying God's involved in everything. That's, that's right. That's the theology drawn out of the text. You cannot throw the dice without, and it being a four or a five, without God. That's right. That, again, 
look at we we didn't get that from a dictionary. That's that's the book of Proverbs. Yeah, that's right. We draw our theology out of the text of the Bible, and the biblical Christian says, "I submit to the Scripture." Yeah, that's right. And that, and you're right. It, it, in Proverbs sixteen thirty three, that's not a, a way for us to divine God's will. It's Absolutely. Not that we, okay, Lord, if you want me to, uh, you know, if you want me to marry Sally, let this dice be a four. If you right. want me to marry Susie, let it be a five. If you want me to marry, you know, and then throw, that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we're Absolutely. talking about. Absolutely, because we've got biblical guidance elsewhere on how to find the right mate. Yeah, and and right. the rolling of the dice is not the way. <laughs> but yeah, and so even though we don't divine God's will, yeah. this is not like some, you know, that, that's that's fortune telling. Uh-huh. We're not talking about that. But God is not um, this deistic God that is removed from His creation. In fact, Hebrews one three, He upholds all things. By the word of his power, and and I have such a profound—that's uh, going to come out wrong—profound understanding, not profound, a profound um, belief in, and respect for, and profound awe of the power of God that I I'm not even comfortable saying. And I know what people mean when they say things like this, but it, you know, God it really, we need God to intervene here. Mm. You know, we need God really intervened in this situation. Mm-hmm. You know. Because to say that God intervenes is to imply that most of the time God is up in heaven and he's just kind of twiddling his anthropomorphic thumbs without a whole lot to do. And every once in a while he sees something, oh, I, I need to intervene. intervene here and get that back in, in order. Now, every, every atom in the entire universe is being held in its proper place by the constant exertion of God's power. And I tell people, if God were to ever stop working, even for a nanosecond, if you were to ever take a break and just stop mm-hmm. working, we would all vaporize. Yes. We would cease He's to holding exist. us all together. Yeah. Yeah. Holding everything together. Yeah. And yet, you know, his sovereign decree over everything, he's decreed everything, but he is not, he's not the author of evil. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, how can you say he's decreed everything and yet he's not the author of evil? Because the Bible teaches that. Yes. He's not the author of evil. He, he's not the author of cancer or arthritis or um, someone getting killed in a car accident or uh, you know a, a child dying. Mm-hmm. He's not the author of that, but right. he is sovereign over it. Yes, that's what. Now right. a lot of people don't like that. Yes. It makes them really uncomfortable, John. Yeah. What would? Well, they, people say that sounds like uh, determinant determinism, which is this impersonal force. What we're saying is. There's a purpose for evil. Evil is evil. Mm -hmm. But what you're left with without this understanding of sovereignty, and we could define it as providence. It's a good word. It is a great word. What we mean by that is God has ordained all things for his glory. Romans 11.36, from him and to him and for him. It's, it's, It's... are all things yep. to him be the glory. If any part of that opening statement is not true, then he doesn't get all the glory. That's right. And so the opposite of that is purposeless evil. Is that going to be more comforting to say to someone, right. um, your, your child has died, uh, it didn't make it to the second month, but um, God had nothing to do with that. Um, it, 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 it get, trying to get God off the hook. But yeah. just, I love as a pastor now, with my understanding drawn from the scripture, to say, you know, we don't understand this, but God has a purpose. Mm-hmm. Mom, God has a purpose right now, and you can glorify him by your response right now. But it's not like there's this weak God who tried. This, weak, this word of faith, God, is a weak God, because oh, unless totally, you get all totally of your weak. ducks in a row, you could have your son die because of something you did. And God had to say, I have my hands tied. The God of the Bible intervenes, to, to use that, that word, rarely, because he's functioning as God and supreme and sovereign and providential ruler all the time. That's right. Yeah. And so there's, there's a quote I wanted to bring uh, to, to the table here 
of, of, of Spurgeon where he says, there is no, no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing, talk about a superl superlative, there's nothing for which the children of God more, ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master of all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own, own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon their throne. Then he says, on the other hand, there is no doctrine more hated by worldlings. And there he's talking not only of people in the world, but worldly minded Christians. Yeah. No truth of which they've made such a football, something they kick around as the great, stupendous, but yet most certain doctrine of the sovereignty of the infinite Jehovah. Men will allow God to be everywhere except on his throne. So hear that. If God has... The comfort I can bring as a pastor to someone is to say, rather than God had nothing to do with this, the, the fact your, your child has cancer, let's say, is to say that God has ordained this, and he's also the one who can overrule this. Mm -hmm. And should your child die, he's going to bring eternally good purposes out of it. That's right. Even though cancer is an evil, even though sin is an evil. Mm -hmm. but we're talking about real life people and real life events to say that God has ordained everything. We're actually taking that on board because the scripture does. Scripture and God does. doesn't hide and say, you know, I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm a really just nice God. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, God didn't just have to... Let the devil bring the flood. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, God brought the flood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he takes ownership when someone is born with crippling conditions or they've got great eyesight. He says, is it not right. I, the Lord, that does this? Right. Exodus 4, verse 11. Who has made man's mouth, who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? Are you getting that from a dictionary? No. <laughs> no. And see, that... So... You know, I've watched, well, you know Andrew Womack, and mm -hmm. he stayed in, in this home. Mm -hmm. um, but Andrew Womack gets his definition of sovereignty from the dictionary. He literally opens up the dictionary, and he reads the dictionary. And I know some of you are thinking, but God is sovereign. You know, I just happened to write down the dictionary definition of sovereign. Let me read this to you. Here's what the dictionary says. If you use it as a noun, the word sovereign means chief of state in a monarchy. When you use it as an adjective, it's talking about paramount or supreme. I believe that God is paramount and supreme. He's the top of the food chain. Don't get your theology from Noah Webster. I mean, get your theology from Scripture. You can't open up a dictionary and, and start getting your theology from there. Um, and you know, even with even with theological terms, for example, let's take just for, as an example the word repentance in the Greek metanoia. Mm -hmm. When you look at it in Greek, the definition of the Greek term it means to change your mind, mm -hmm. and it does. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it in context, it means so much more than that. You know, you can't get you you cannot derive your full understanding of a of a term in Scripture simply from the dictionary, uh, well, especially not from a, an English Noah Webster dictionary, mm -hmm. but you can't even always get it from looking at what the word itself means in a, in a lexicon or something to, to look up. The, and that's a good thing to do, etymology, study the word. and look yes. at what it is. But metanoia is a great example. You look at how it's used in context. It, it does include a change in mind, but yes. it's so much more than that. It, uh, John the Baptist, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Paul to King Agrippa in Acts 26, So King Agrippa, I kept declaring that all men everywhere should repent and perform deeds appropriate to repentance. So it's, it's not just changing your mind intellectually. It includes that, but it's more than that. When God grants repentance, yes, our minds are changed, but our affections are changed, our desires are changed, everything about us is changed, and there's fruit in keeping with repentance. It, it results in tangible fruit. So it's all of that to say, and I, I'm, I apologize if that was too long, but you you can't just look at the dictionary definition of a term and say, oh, I understand that. Look and see how it is actually used in Scripture. 
Yeah, and there's a science to interpretation, and I'm sure most people know the word uh, hermeneutics, uh, the science of biblical interpretation. Um, hermeneutics is not hermeneutics, like a German soccer player, <laughs> you know. Um, it, it, there's a science, and what you do, rather than going to the English dictionary, which is simply a record of how a word is being used in a given society, that's all it is. That's right. We ought to go to the scripture and say, what does, from Genesis to Revelation, what does, if we draw out the truth of, of what this book is telling us, how does the Bible define sovereignty? Yes. And it's not the supreme one, the one in charge, the one who's the excelling one. Right. That's what it's the one. Says. It's the God of Daniel 4. That's right. It's the God of Romans 9. And that was my issue, yep. that I could wake every moment. I, I pictured myself waking uh, at, a, at a hotel room at the bottom of the, Mount Everest. This was just in my own thinking. Opening the curtains and, and looking. Yeah, Everest is still there. And, and, and that's what you have to deal with with the God of the Bible. He's sovereign over all things. And it's the Bible that tells us that. Yeah, that's right. That you can't, you might say, look, next Monday I'm going to. Because the scriptures don't say that. Because you don't know. Well, at least, I don't know, I don't know this or that and who's, who's doing this in the government. But at least I know on Monday I will. No, God says you can't do that. James 4. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's, the, that's drawing from the scripture. It happens to be James 4. Yeah. It doesn't mention the word sovereignty there. But you know what? That's all that's about God's sovereignty. You're right. And, you know, some say, oh, well, some translations don't even have the word sovereignty in them. Well, guess what? Zero translations have the word trinity in them. I'll go a stage further. Not... Do you know the Bible doesn't even have the word Bible in it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's on the front, but... It's only, it's only covered, but yeah, it's not inspired text. Yeah, it? yeah. It's before Genesis 1-1. <laughs> yeah, so, it, you know, you can't... It's such a, it is such a sophomoric argument. Yeah, yeah. To you say, would say hermeneutics 101. Hermeneutics 101. Don't get your theology from a dictionary. Get it from the Bible. Just because a word may not be in some translations, it doesn't mean the concept is not taught. Trinity is not Absolutely. in the Bible either. You believe something other than the taught. Trinity, you're believing in a different God than the God of the Bible. Yeah. The word Trinity may not be in there, but the concept is Absolutely. there's one God, there's three persons. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that's another example of something that we can't fully understand. Uh -huh. The sovereignty of God, the accountability of man. God is one being in three persons, each person distinct and fully God. And yet, the Bible doesn't teach in three, teach three gods. That's right. One God in three persons. We're monotheists. That, we're monotheists. And Trinitarians. Now, I can't wrap my mind around no. that. I, you know, it, it is, it is. This is what we call to use the term, an antinomy, mm. an antinomy. Two seemingly mutually contradictory term or concepts, rather. They seem to be mutually contradictory, and yet the Bible teaches them as truth, and so yes. we believe them to be true. Yes. So I'm to you, God, responsibility, of man. Yeah. That's an antinomy, but the Bible teaches both, so we believe both. God is one, and yet he is a triune God. That seems to be mutually contradictory. And yet emphasizing the word teaching. seems. Yes, yeah. seems. To our, to our little yes. finite, fallen, finite minds. Um, That's why no human analogy works when we talk about yeah. the Trinity. Yeah, if, if you're, we're in the summer, and so Vacation Bible School is coming up. And if you happen to be a Vacation Bible School teacher and you're scheduled to teach me, Please, no, the Trinity is not like an egg. Okay, the Trinity is not like a three-leaf clover. The Trinity is not like water that can be liquid, solid, or vapor. Stop. Mm -hmm. when, when God said, to whom or to what will you compare me? That wasn't a challenge. <laughs> the whole well, point sir. is that there is nothing that you can compare God to. That's yes. the point. Yes. God's not like an egg. Okay. <laughs> to be a biblical Christian, we've, we're bumping into mystery all the time. Absolutely. And so where are you going to place the mystery? What we should do is 
rather than place the mystery on everything, so we can't know anything, be kind of agnostic about who God is and what he is and what we should do is find out what God has revealed and uh, say it should be like, like this Bible here, his revelation of truth, where he has closed his mouth, John Calvin said, we should desist from inquiry. Mm -hmm. that's right. And that's a safe place. Yep. That's right. And so we say, you know, beyond that, it's mystery. And God hasn't revealed that. But this is what I know. I know Acts 2. I know yeah. Daniel 4. Yeah. I know Romans 9. Yeah. And it says what it says. And when I wake up in the morning and open the curtains, it's still going to say it. That's right. That's right. And, and John, I, for one, am glad that... The God I serve is not a God that I can fully comprehend. Because let me tell you something, if I could fully comprehend God, then my God would be a very small God. Yeah. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, as well might a gnat, G-N-A-T, as well might a gnat seek to drink in the ocean, so might a finite creature seek to comprehend the eternal God. Yeah. So, yes, there's a mystery. I'm glad there is. Uh, God has revealed everything that we need to know about Him. Doesn't mean we fully understand everything, but we we have everything that we need to know, and everything that we do know that He has revealed is true. Absolutely, it's it. it you know, a, a, a father and a mother can be standing over the the little bedside of the little baby that's born, and the baby's not understanding everything that's being communicated, but. The baby is understanding the love and the warmth and the care of the parents. That's right. That's very real. Amen. It may not understand trigonometry on day three of its life. Yeah. But in time, they will learn a, a, a lot more about the parents. But what is being communicated is real. And what God has revealed to us is real, even though uh, he's communicating to us in terms only finite people can understand. Yeah. He's Where's the infinite. If, if God dis decided to talk about any subject to us and talked on the level of his knowledge, mm -hmm. we would not understand the thing. So he stoops yes, that's right. to reveal truth to us that is absolutely valid and true, even though there's times we say, I, I, I get this, but what about this? And God says, uh, leave that with me. Yeah. And this is the, the area where we leave it with him. The mystery is outside of what... He has revealed. But what he has revealed is that because God knows the end from the beginning, did God know there was going to be a fall of man before he created man? Absolutely. Every Orthodox Christian who believes in God's exhausted knowledge has to say yes, or else you've got a different God. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And so he's, could he have stopped the fall? Answer. Absolutely. Did he allow the fall? Absolutely. So he ordained it? Absolutely. And, and they say, you're, you're saying he ordained sin. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ was the lamb slain, not at the cross of Christ 2,000 years ago, but before the foundation of the world. Why? God knew sin would be in the world and in need of a savior and ordained the Lord Jesus Christ, ordained that the Lord yes. Jesus Christ would be the savior for real sin he knew would happen. Yes, that's right. And... You saying that jogs something in my mind because it's, it's directly related to this. We earlier read Acts chapter 2 that this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, that word in the Greek foreknowledge, prognosko. It, it, um, to know beforehand. To know beforehand. Now, the Arminians say, oh, well, that is God looking down through the corridors of time to, and he knows what will and will not happen. So, well, no, God didn't just look down through the corridors of time and, and you know, he's like he peering way down in the, well, look at there. Wow, my son is going to be crucified. Mm. It, it, it's not something that he's just foreseeing in the future that he has no control over. He ordained it. And now this is, this is going to be a real challenge for our Arminian friends dealing mm. with this view of foreknowledge is just, looking down through the corridors of time. Not only, not only was the crucifixion of Christ foreknown, prognosco, Jesus himself is described as mm -hmm. foreknown by God. First Peter chapter one, verse 20, speaking of Jesus, for he was known before 
the foundation of the world. Known by whom? Known by the Father. So you're, this is foreknowledge. Prognosco. So you're going to tell me that God looked down through the corridor, corridors of time and he's, well, well look at there. I'm going to have a son. That's heresy. This, this, he was known, this, the, God has set his affections. Yes. God didn't just look down the, through the corridors of time and discover Jesus. Jesus has always existed from eternity past. And from eternity past, God set his affections upon the Son in eternity past. Now, I, that, even that scrambles my brain, but that's what Scripture teaches. Yes. So that is a, a very weak, weak view of foreknowledge, just looking down through the corridors of time. If, if you're going to say that, then you're going to have to say the same about Jesus. We could talk a, a lot about the word no. Yes. And um, you, Israel, only have I known right. among all the nations. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not like I, I didn't know about the Chinese. <laughs> right. um, um, but I, I kind of knew about you. It's only you have I known in a redemptive love. That's right. It's talking about setting his love. Adam knew his wife Eve. And the result was a child. There was an intimacy. And so the, the Arminian view of foreknowledge means that God knows our actions ahead of time. Right. Can you bring that definition to that verse you just quoted and say, that's saying that God the Father knew that Jesus' actions would be good. Yeah. No. That is so weak. Oh, it's heresy. It's heresy? Yeah, it's heresy. What it means is that God set his love on his son. Anything less than that is not what is drawn out of our Bibles. And the opposite, I'm kind of an unusual fellow, but I, I, I love the fact when, uh, though the scene is horrific, where Jesus is, is talking about real people who will face God's judgment, and he will say, I never knew you. Knew. You. He's never, using that word no in the same way. I never knew you. No, I never. Charlie Giles. No, I uh, no, I can't. Uh, well, look, look him up in yeah, the phone book. I'm not I didn't know about you. No, it's saying I never knew you in a redemptive way. Yeah. And, and I actually get comfort. This is the silly part of me. I get part, uh, comfort because Arminian theology is actually destroyed. Not every Arminian believes this, but in, in terms of losing salvation, Mm -hmm. It does not say, I knew you for eight years, and then you blew it. That's right. I knew you for a little bit of time. I was, my hopes were really high regarding you. I knew you for, no, there was never a time. There was never a time I knew yeah. you. And it's talking redemptively. Redemptively. Cause, and so that, that's a redemptive word. Yeah, it and is. Foreknowledge is a redemptive it is, word. It is a redemptive word, dear friends. Hear that. This is a redemptive word. It is not just intellectual knowledge. Those, you know, in Matthew 7, oftentimes when I, I find myself wondering, when these people read those words from Jesus, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons, perform signs and wonders in your name? And Jesus says, I never knew you. Sometimes I wonder, I mean, when Kenneth Copeland reads that, or Benny Hinn, or Andrew Womack, or any of these, who do they think Jesus is talking about, uh, if, if not people in the signs and wonders that hold to that theology. But but exactly what we're saying, John, this is this knowing I never knew you. This is not Jesus saying, wow, I, I had no idea you existed mm -hmm. until I, I saw you. I had no, you know, and can I see your ID? No, it, it's this is a redemptive knowing, right? He do, yeah, he does not say, I didn't know what your actions were or would be. Again, it, it, there's, there's a consistency in Scripture about what the word knowing means in the redemptive sense, which is where we find the word foreknowledge used. Yeah. There's consistency, and it, you, 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 we must gain a definition that's consistent with all of Scripture. It might be able to make it fit in a certain passage, but if there's 18 other passages where it won't fit, you've got to reject it. That's right. Scripture interprets Scripture. Yes. Yeah. And so... The biblical data informs us and gives us definition. Right. Not an English dictionary, not our thoughts. We have to challenge our thoughts by saying, okay, what does for new mean? And it 
does not say he foreknew people's actions. It, for, it talks about he foreknew people, those whom he foreknew. I remember reading that and, and thinking, I've assumed for 20 years as a Christian, foreknowledge means he knows what actions men will do. But that's not in the text. No, it's not. No, those whom he foreknew, those people whom he people. foreknew. And that, Romans 8 there, that, that is what we sometimes refer to as the golden chain yes, of redemption. Of redemption. And where... The knowledge that, is redemption. That's right. That's right. There's no place in that chain that you can you can break it. No. These are links, if you think of five links in a chain, that God forges. These are actions of God. God foreknew. He also predestined. He called. He justified. He glorified. All actions of God. And it's not a reactionary God here. Right. Either in salvation or in world history. Right. That's the God of the Bible. That's right. And it's, and it's, it's so certain. I, I, love, I love that text, the golden chain of redemption, because the last, the last verb there, glorified, in the past tense. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have my glorified body. You don't have your glorified mm -hmm. body. We're not yet glorified. Mm -hmm. And yet it speaks of us in the past tense as having been glorified. Well, we're not yet glorified. But we are glorified because that is how certain. That's how certain. Yes. It is so certain. It is our redemption, our calling is so certain. It is more certain than the sun is going to come up tomorrow morning. Yeah. In the east, I would sooner expect the sun to rise in the west tomorrow morning than for us to not one day realize our glorification. It's that certain. Absolutely. So, so again, the God of the Bible is not this reactionary God who says, "Look, things have gone wrong. Look, oh, this fall of man. Who ever thought that would happen?" Yeah. Uh, what are we going to do, angels? Uh, let's synergize. Let's get a think tank going, Gabriel, have you got any ideas? What are we going to do? Um, but, the, the, you know, to, Calvinists, they say that God ordained the fall. Yeah, because the Bible does. The Bible does. Yeah, it, it, it's you, to have a savior for a, a world that's not fallen, that won't make no sense. And so you've got a savior right. foreordained before the foundation of the world. What's he saving people from? Right. A lack of purpose. Right. Self-esteem. No, from sin. Yep. Then he must have known that sin would occur. So he knew this, that the fall would happen. So he ordained, because he could have stopped it. That's right. He ordained the fall. Yep. Yes, he did. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible teaches that. That's right. That's right. And, and that's, uh, yeah, so many people are trying to get God off the hook. For, but God never attempts to get himself off the hook. Right. At, at all, on any level. Amos chapter 3. Does disaster befall a city and I not do it? That's God talking right there. Word of faith says, no, you didn't. That was the devil. Yeah. And, and in fact, um, a quote here that I have from Andrew Womack talking about uh, the sovereignty of God. He says, uh, referring to the sovereignty of God, he said, God either does it or Satan has to come get permission from God. Now he's saying that as in that's what we believe, you know, people in, in our camp. You know, these, these people who believe in the sovereignty of God, that God either does something or Satan has to come and get permission from God to do it. And he's mocking that when in actuality, oh, yeah, that, have you read Job chapter one lately? I mean, Satan has to, Satan had to get permission from God mm -hmm. and God gave him that permission and, and mm -hmm. Satan, Satan went and he struck from Job everything that he had, but he did have to get permission from God. Satan Satan does have power, John, but he's on a leash, right? Yes, yes. And God is holding the other end of that yeah. short leash. And, and yeah. So Otherwise, you've got a God who says, oh, that's gone wrong, what can we do? Oh, the devil's done this, what can we do? A reactionary God. A reactionary God. God doesn't react to anything. There's no plan B. For him to be a reactionary God, it denies his exhaustive knowledge. We're back to that again. Yeah. That's because... Right. He's not having to react because he knew it would happen and could have stopped any event. 
yeah. and allowed it, yeah. and therefore ordained it. Right. So the devil has certainly done things in human history. He is an opposing foe. He uh, afflicts, he tempts, he does all of this, but not outside of the governing control and providence of God. That's right. And that's what the whole book of Job teaches. Yes, the, the, whole, the whole point of the book yeah. of Job is the sovereignty of God. Yeah, not the free will of man. Yeah, and God is, I, I, heard, I can't even remember who I heard say this, but uh, someone said it. I, I didn't say it. But God is not a frustrated deity. Mm -hmm. He's not a frustrated deity. Jesus, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't say, I came to seek and to make salvation possible. Right. Jesus didn't make salvation possible. He came to save. He will save his people from their sins. Absolutely. Matthew one twenty one. Yes. You've, you've got a, the cross where Isaiah prophesying it says, he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, not frustrated. The opposite of frustrated is satisfied. Satisfied, that's right. And in... The cross, the Savior was satisfied by what he was able to accomplish there. That's right. Rather than, I, I, this Philip P. Barnes, you know, <laughs> yeah. I've done all I can. I, 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 I try. And, and that's what they think gets God off the hook. He tried really hard. And it, it, the, the stubborn will of man prevented him. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. And so this, as we've been saying, this is twin truths, an antinomy, two seemingly mutually contradictory things that are taught by Scripture and yet are both true. The sovereignty of God, election from before the foundation of the world, that is true. The responsibility of man, the accountability of man, that is true. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Scripture teaches both. Uh, that, that's a great point, I think, that needs to be emphasized, Justin, because you've got sections of the church or sectors of the church where you'd say they're, they're sovereignites. All they talk about is the sovereignty of God. Yeah, yeah, and you've got others that are free willites, right. and they might even call their church that, sovereign churches and free will churches. Uh -huh. And the Bible teaches sovereign free will in the yeah. sense of, we do what we wish to do, and none of the things we do is outside of the ordination of God, and the Bible teaches both things. It's hard for us to combine in our heads two equal truths. You, mm -hmm. you use the word autonomy, and it's right. The Bible specifically teaches the sovereignty of God so clearly, and it's defined the way the Bible des describes it as him ordaining and ruling over all things uh, the way that you would speak about the smallest thing in the first century is something like a sparrow they had no idea of microbes and neutrons and yeah. atoms and yeah. you talk about a, a, a sparrow falling to the ground mm -hmm. and Jesus says that cannot happen apart from the father right that what's that the word sovereignty is not in that verse that's right. The word providence is not in that verse. But, it's but what's drawn out of the text of that verse is providence, sovereignty. It might be a, a bird that is seen, or it could be a bird in a forest that falls to the ground. No one sees it mm -hmm. except God. And God says, not only did I see it, it couldn't even have happened outside of God. Right. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the God of the Bible. You say, where do you get all oh, the words sovereign? Talk about that incident of a sparrow falling to the ground. And Jesus says, you don't understand that without sovereignty. That's right. That's exactly right. So, yes, the, the word, yeah, by many translations, is not used. Some mm. it is, but, it, but, uh, but Trinity is not used. So it's, uh, it, but the concept is absolutely there. It is unmistakable. You, you can't do, as I said, I think earlier, you can't do enough hermeneutical gymnastics to get away from it. So, Again, in the first century... Being God, he could have confused everyone by saying, um, God in the flesh, I want to tell you about atoms and, and uh, molecules and germs and no germ can be on your hand except uh, apart from the Father. And they'll, 
What? But they understood sparrows. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they understood sparrows. And I've, I've often thought of what Jesus said when he said, consider the lilies of the field, yeah. not even Solomon, and yeah. you know, and all of his splendor was arrayed at like like one of these. And I, and I find myself thinking about that. And I, there's a part of me that wishes I could go back in time and talk to the people and, and say, hey, guys, you know what Jesus just said? That you have no idea. Because one of these days, way into the future, they're going to invent something called a microscope. And we're, people are going to realize just how dizzyingly complex even a lily is and they yes. have no idea yeah and we have the benefit of a, yeah a little bit of a <laughs> yeah techno technological the drill. simple cell is not simple there's nothing simple about the simple cell that's right <laughs> again you know what we're talking about is the difference between a god who has limited knowledge and a God who had all knowledge. And every Orthodox Christian believes in the omniscience of God. Mm -hmm. If you really understand that, you cannot help but believe in the sovereignty of God. Yeah. The logical outworking of God knowing everything that could possibly take place, that will take place, and then saying, I let it happen or I don't ha let it happen, which we've yeah. all agreed he's got the capability of doing. Right. You end up with the biblical view of sovereignty, which happens to be the reform view. Yeah, that's right. And, and John, so many people have a, a caricatured understanding of sovereignty, of, of the doctrine of election, of Calvinism, to use that, to yeah. use that term. A lot of people, when, just they, when they hear that term Calvinism, they all have to write it off, even though they don't understand right. what... Right. But the caricatured understanding, so many people think of Calvinism like this, that God is up in heaven and there's this mass of humanity that's trying to get into heaven. And God's just got his anthropomorphic hand up saying, no, 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 not going to let you. Okay, yeah, you in the back, you in the, in the green mm -hmm. shirt, all right, I'll let you in. No, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. okay, you over there in the, in the sweater, all right, I'll let you in. That's what most people think about Calvinism. That's not the biblical picture. Not at the, all. Biblical, the biblical picture is that all of humanity is running to hell just as fast as their little feet, their little fallen feet will carry them because that's what they want. They love their sin. They love the darkness. They hate the light. While they're running, they're firing arrows at the true God. Yes. Yes. So everybody is, is running to hell because that's what they want. They, yes. they love their sin. They hate the God of the Bible. They're enemies with God. And so God, is, God would be entirely just to let every single one of us go to hell. If he were to let every single one of us go to hell, he would have done none of us any wrong. Yeah. So if we acknowledge that, that God would be entirely just to let all of us go to hell, then how is, any, how is he any less just when in his mercy... He reaches out and he, he saves some. He saves some. He's obligated to save none of us. Absolutely. But he chooses to save some. Does that make him any less just? Absolutely not. Uh, imagine the angels, and the, the scripture is very clear. The rebellious angels, there will not be one of them that are redeemed. Right. <clears throat> The, the, the righteous angels are not petitioning God and said, look, we demand equal redemption for angels because if you've given it to man, you must give it to angels. They understand the holiness of God. Yeah. They understand the justice of God. And when God is just, by definition, he's not being unjust. That's right. You can't petition a court and say, we need to get this judge off the, the bench, you know, we don't want him ruling as a judge anymore. Why? Why, why get rid of this judge? Because every decision he makes is just. Yeah, right. Try that. Yeah. Try that. So God is absolutely just. So no one in the universe will ever get injustice. But right. some will get justice and some will get mercy. And even those who get mercy, get mercy because of justice, because God Injustice sent the Son of God into the world to bear the sins of the elect mm -hmm. who 
in their place received the justice they deserve, which was his God the Father's wrath. That's right. Which is what God saves us from in sending his son into the world. Romans 5, verse 6. Um, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it goes on to talk about being saved from the wrath of God. And it was God's idea to send his son to save us from his wrath. Again, when Romans 9 speaks of this, of God's election, there's this objection raised of that, that Paul anticipates what's going to be mm-hmm. raised of that, you know, if, if, if it's not based on our actions, not based on our will, Romans 9, 16, not based on our will, hear that, hear that our ex- exertion, our, our running, but on God who has mercy. Mm-hmm. Man is also totally responsible, but God has mercy on whom he wills. And let's put it in business terms. At the end of a year, a lot of businesses, they want to give to certain charitable organizations or churches for tax write-offs and say you've got a very wealthy individual who wants to give a million dollars away. You know, We're not going to talk about the motivation of his heart, but let, let's say he wants to do that. Ten organizations he wants to send $100,000 to. Okay, let's picture that in our mind. That, that's, that's, he doesn't have to do that. And so right. when he does that, there's not a legitimate thing an 11th organization can do to sue him and say, look, you owe us that $100,000 too. God had no responsibility to give, excuse me, the man had no responsibility to give anything to, to anyone. That's right. And so when we talk about the mercy of God, the fact that there's going to be one person redeemed should blow our mind. The Bible says it's a number no one can count. Yeah. yeah. And all around the throne, redeemed. And again, no angels are going to be redeemed. No. What happened to you, angel? Well, I was a rebellious angel and, and God became an angel to save me. No. God became a man. Uh, God took on flesh to save the sons of men. Yeah. And it blows angelic minds like it should ours. Yeah, that's right. And in all of this, no one ever gets... So the, the, the idea Calvinism is unfair. No, no one gets unfair. If we want... We uh, don't want justice. No, no. And, and justice is we all go to hell. That's right. And because we are evil, man's heart is evil... Um, well, you've got a very low view of man. No, we've got a biblical view of man since the fall. The heart of man is evil. How many texts declare that? It's all you know, over the Bible. The heart of man is not just this little tendency towards evil. It says it's, it's evil above all things. Yep. The heart is desperately wicked. Yep. And on a civil level, man is capable of much good. Not every... Uh, one who is unsaved is um, incapable of helping elderly people cross roads, giving to charity, lots of nice things. But it's on a civil, civil level. But in the terms of looking up and seeing how God views things, Romans 3 still says what it says. Open the curtain window and Romans 3 will still say, what Romans 3 says tomorrow, there is none that do good. No, not one. You, oh, you, you're speaking uh, in hyperbole, Paul. No, he says, no, not one. Get it. And he's quoting the Old Testament. And then Romans 3 goes on to, to say that this is the universal condition of man. This is not just some people in society, the, the, the criminals out there. This is all of our uh, condition before a holy God God says there's no one who's good. Yeah. And it's on that basis, only when we get that, we get to the good news of this is what God does now for rebellious, evil people. Yeah, that's right. And unless you understand that, you don't understand Romans, you don't understand the gospel. No. And, and so what are you going to fill your church with if you, if, if you teach that man's basically good, you just need to tweak a few things. It's kind of, you know, get, God's kind of happy you've turned out as well as you have. 
and uh, hear, hear the, this message. He'll give you a pep talk for the week. All right, but don't call out a church. Yeah. You've got a crowd, but you haven't got a church. That's right. Yeah. A church can only come about because it's a supernatural organization because God makes Christians. God has sheep mm -hmm. who love the voice of the shepherd. Right. And so the preacher, the pastor, gets up and he says what the scripture says, knowing that only the sheep will like it. That's right. But he's after sheep. That's right. That's right. And so if there's eight sheep or 800 sheep or 8,000 sheep, he's just happy there's sheep. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't want, if he's a godly pastor, is lots and lots of goats. The goats. Yeah. Right. And he's not there to entertain goats, try and get goats, what will bring goats back. Yeah. That's why there's so many churches that follow the secret sensitive movement, whether it's Joel Osteen, whether it's Ed Young Jr., whether it's Stephen Furtick, um, you know, fill in the blank, that, that turn their churches into places of entertainment. You know, and you've got to come up with some gimmick for this week to outdo the gimmick that you had that yeah. last week yeah. to keep entertaining people because you're trying you're as Spurgeon said, <laughs> we're um we're we're not feeding sheep, we're entertaining goats. Mm -hmm. And he said that a hundred and, you know, whatever, 50 plus years ago. But um, sheep want to be fed. Yes. Goats want to be entertained. Yes. And so when you look at these secret sensitive churches, that's, that's those aren't churches, they're goat farms. And I don't say that to be mean, but it's, but it's true. Are you sure you're just not jealous? Oh, See, that's no. what I've been accused of. You know? Same here. The you know, people... And the size of their ministry, yeah, I, yeah. that's it. You're to, oh. No, I would I, literally I, rather have eight sheep oh my than 8,000 goats. Oh my goodness, yeah. I am so not <laughs> jealous knowing knowing what they will have to give an answer for one mm. day. Mm. Whether it's the false prophecies, whether it's the dilution of the gospel, whether it's the twisting of scripture, not handling the word of truth rightly, making your church into a place of, of entertainment, and making it look like the world and having to give an answer for that, I am not jealous in the least uh, of, the, of those people. I, I recently uh, brought a message to the church about the vision of, of, of King's Church, and I said, it, it, this is really going to excite the sheep. I said, this week we're dealing with verse 8 in the passage, and guess what? Next week we're going to start with verse 9. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... Um, what you're not going to give this away and that away and and no we 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 that's it and that's all I got and the sheep yeah I've, I've been longing for this I want to know the true God and and Sproul I see Sproul's point is is that in much of the church there's been an eclipse of God and he makes the point that in an, a solar eclipse something's being obscured. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone came to Sproul and says, I, I, I honestly believe our preacher, she said, is trying to withhold from us the, the revelation of the true God. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, right. Because he's offensive. Yeah. He's on the throne. He rules. Yeah. We want to say, I'm, can I have a God who will help me get this, achieve this, be this? Yeah, that's right. And God says, I'm on the throne and uh, this is my gospel the gospel of the kingdom of God, yeah. that I'm willing to govern the human white race. Yeah. That, that's, that's not what you're going to hear at these churches. Yeah. God is willing to govern rebel sinners. That's right. Uh, so, sorry, can we change the channel? Right. <laughs> yeah. And that is exactly what makes the gospel so powerful, is that it's not what people Lost people, the unregenerate, it's not what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, lost people, as I said earlier, they have a religious itch that they want to scratch. And they want a God made after their own image, but they don't want the God of the Bible. They don't want the God who says, deny yourself. They don't want the God who says, um, take up the cross, meaning be willing to die for the gospel. They mm -hmm. don't want the God that says, put to death the deeds of the body. They don't want the God that says, for to you it has been granted not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. They don't want the God who says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not the message that unregenerate people want to hear. 
But that is exactly what makes the gospel so powerful is because it is only the sheep who want to, who will respond to that. The goats will not respond to that. And it's so powerful that even under persecution, God can grow a church, mm -hmm. a real church, with a message of dying to self. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it's totally supernatural. That's why someone who just thinks I've got oratory skills or I can do this because of I, I, I've done some business uh, marketing. I, I know what will bring a crowd in. God says, what are you talking about? Um, no, what, what we need are, are people like yourself who, 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 and others that God has raised up and is raising up will say, this is what the Bible says, and the sheep are going to love it, and, and I know ahead of time the goats won't. And you, you only see that in, personified in the Lord Jesus. He told them, the people, everything his father told him to say, and you, you read Jesus, he didn't just sneak in election once in a while and then yeah. say, election. And now, he, sometimes his whole message was that. Yeah. John 6 was all about it. All about it, yeah. And, and most folk walked away. Mm -hmm. And he says, are you going to go too? Uh, to his own disciples. And right. Peter said, you have the words of eternal life. And, and we have to make a choice, don't we? Who do, who do we really want? And the cry of the Christian is the true God, the true God and nothing else. And, and when you and I, because we will be glorified because he speaks of us as in the past tense, which is the point you've, you've brought out, when we see Jesus face to face, that's all, that's all we want. Yes. We're, we're not... We're not going to be talking about, hey, let's look at our mansions now. Nice to see you, Jesus. Yeah. It, it's, it's him face to face. Wouldn't it be horrendous if we get to, to heaven and there's an announcement, Jesus is, is away from the throne right now, but leave a message. Or leave it, Jesus is away, he's creating other galaxies for a while. We've got some great entertainment for you. Mm -hmm. We just want to see him. That's right. We just want the real Jesus. That's right. Uh, and it's not the Mormon Jesus or a made-up Jesus or a Jehovah's Witness Jesus. It's the Jesus of the Bible, and it's the God of the Bible we're going to see. Sure. And it's the God of the Bible who inspired Daniel 4 and Romans 9 and Acts 2. That's right. Yeah. The, the verses you brought out, that's the God of the Bible. That's, that's who we're going to see for all eternity, not someone who's different from what he's revealed here. Amen. So rather than going to a, a dictionary, yeah. we, we start here and we end here. That's right. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit of God who determines the meaning of a word, not the dictionary. It, it is the Holy Spirit of God who puts the words of Scripture together. It's the context that, that determines the meaning. He is The Holy Spirit is the one who puts those words in their context. He determines the meaning of a word, i.e., foreknowledge, yes. election, yes. predestination, yes. repentance. The Holy Spirit determines the meaning of those terms, not, not which the, is why he Webster. then says, "Study to show yourself approved of God, rightly dividing the word of truth." Second Timothy two fifteen, because by study, not by tradition, you'll tr you'll understand the true God. What, do we, what is tradition? Well, some say it's this, some say it's that. Well, you never know because godly people on both sides of the aisle, uh, you know, disagree. No, no, study and you'll know. Not study and you'll become more vague. And No, we study for clarity. We study for the sake of gaining clarity so that we study the word foreknowledge like you brought out and we either submit to the revelation of Scripture or we stay with our tradition. Yeah. And, and I've had that choice, you've had that choice, and the fact that we come out saying, thank God for deliverance from my former understanding because I had such a low view of God, a shallow view of God. Yeah. I'm coming away with an awe of God that I never had before, and it's born out of the Scripture and submitting to the Scripture. It's like, why, why if there's a Sedona out there, and the Grand Canyon out there, just in the state of Arizona, would you be satisfied 
just staring at a brick wall. Mm -hmm. Right. The compa there's no comparison. I don't want the brick wall. I want the view of God that's biblical. Yeah. And if that takes me to a, the Reformed tree and find out that theologians have been waiting at the top of the tree for a long while, that was my experience. Like, yeah. I, I thought I knew better. I thought um, the, the ideas they were articulating were past their sell-by date. We got over that. Um, um, no, it, it's it's the God of the Bible, and when you 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 sit and you read some of these gifts to us, which are the gifts that God has given through the centuries of of men, Ephesians four, it, it's not just the people in our own day that the pastor John MacArthur, it's 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 the Luthers, it's the Spurgeons, it's the Athanasius, it's it's these gifts to the church. You know, the list is almost endless. Who've sought the Scripture and they've spent five decades in the scripture and certainly shouldn't it be humility to say look, before we move on and just have me and Jesus in uh, under a tree because God was being waiting for me so he could reveal new truth which is where you start getting the heresies and the cults and oh, yeah. all of that doesn't humility say before I move on can I just learn what he learned in five decades because he wrote some things down to tell me about God and where I can see where he gets that from scripture we should say wow that's great insight where he goes off because they're not infallible mm -hmm. we say I can't go with you there scripture doesn't seem to go with me there but we're foolish if we just think church history started 30 years ago or with my birth mm -hmm. it's actually highly arrogant oh it is totally arrogant and so when the greats of church history this was my understanding. When they may not agree on every minor point of doctrine, but when when the greats as God used them were all agreed on sovereignty. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't humility say, why do they believe it? Oh, I mean. Shouldn't humility say, what text did they ever go to? Yeah. And in my realm of the charismatic word of faith, none of us read these guys. No. None of us. No. Zero. Right. It starts with me and my Bible and my personal relationship with God. And that's a valid thing, but it, humility says, doesn't God have a relationship with others too? Right. And God, doesn't he, hasn't he given teachers to the church through the ages? Yeah. And aren't, isn't it for my profit? Isn't it for my maturity? Mm -hmm. So humility to say, it, it should say, what does scripture say and what has God as, in his gifts to the church, what has he revealed about what scripture says? And when, you, when I found out that these guys, all they ever wrote about was scripture, seemingly, mm. you, you read these guys and it's scripture, 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 scripture. Yeah. And you think, how foolish I've been to think it's just me and Jesus. Right. When, when, God, 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 through the scripture, said, son, my son, John, I've given you gifts. Take advantage. It impoverishes your soul to be left to yourself and what happens between your ears. Mm -hmm. And so search the scriptures. If, if, if you read Daniel 4 and you say, you know what? It's got nothing to do with the sovereignty of God. All right, go for it. But guess what? When you open the curtain the next day, you know what? It'll still say what it says. Yeah. God's word doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, we were talking off camera. Um, if you were to take, a, choose a thousand people at random out of John MacArthur's church and then choose a thousand people at random out of Lakewood church, Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland's church or Stephen Furtick's church or Andrew Womack's church and, and, and do Bible drill with those two different groups, which group do you think would have a, better understanding of scripture, a deeper theology. Uh, it, it would be no question. I mean, it, it would be, it would be the most lopsided contest ever. And so our knowledge of God is only as deep as our knowledge of scripture. That is how he, that is how he has revealed himself. If you do not understand, I mean, the more we understand scripture, the more we understand and know God. Mm. And so 
it, it, it speaks for itself. It, it really does. And God has given teachers in the church for a reason. Um, I, I would say just to jump on that, I would look back and say in my involvement in the Word of Faith, we were favorite Word people, not Word of God people. We, we have our favorite texts oh, yeah. taken yeah. out of context. Uh -huh. Right. And there was no desire. Yeah, there was no desire to look at that. Can we look at that verse in context and see whether the devil is actually mentioned in John ten ten? Yeah, you're right, right. Yeah, actually, he's not. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's false shepherds. False. Oh no! It, it, the devil comes to kill. Still, uh, can we? Can we get that? They're not even interested in going there. Yeah, that's right. When I was teaching through John 10, it's, 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 it's so clear what it's actually say when you read it in the context. And again, I just love it when people's eyes are open and say, wow, you, you see it in all full color. It's blazing glory. It's, but we had our text, John 10, 10. Yeah. I remember hearing people say, that's my theology right there. Yeah. Okay, well, can we look at John 10? No. Right. <laughs> exactly. Don't. Let's not let the Bible get in the way of our theology. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, we should probably um, begin to land the plane here, but I, I want to thank you so very much for having this discussion. I, mm. I, I think it'll be, by God's grace, I think it'll be a help to a lot of I people. I pray it will, because I've been helped. It's been encouraging for me. Uh, iron sharpens iron. And uh, I love to talk talk the things of the Lord, talk Amen. the Scripture. So thank Amen. you very much. And, um Dear ones, if you happen to be in the Phoenix area and you're looking for a good church, King's Church in Peoria, uh, kingschurchaz.com. Yes. I got that right off memory. kingschurchaz.com. And uh, I just want to close with the gospel real quickly. Has there been a time in your life when you have been convicted by the Holy Spirit of God that you are a sinner, that you have broken God's laws? You're a liar. You're a thief taking something that doesn't belong to you or you're a blasphemer. We blaspheme God's name in word and deed. You're an adulterer at heart at least. Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery already in his heart. If you have done those things, um, and you have, because all of us have, apart from Christ, you are under the judgment of God. You are under his wrath. And if you die in your sins, you will very rightly, very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. The worm will not die. The fire will not be quenched. Wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth forever and ever. That's the bad news. That's what you deserve. You deserve hell. That's what your sins have earned you. But the good news of the gospel is this, is that God loves you. And God has made a way for you to escape his wrath. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, who lived fully God, fully man, never broke any of God's laws. He was the lamb without blemish. And Jesus willingly laid down his life on the cross. This perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. Mm. Died on the cross, three days later bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And the only way to be saved, to have the wrath of God removed, is to repent of sin, turn from your sin, and place your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You cannot save yourself. Your works are as filthy rags. They will profit you nothing. Lay your works down. Trust in Christ. Repent of sin. Turn from sin. Ask yourself, has there been a change in my life? As, are my desires different? Have my affections changed? Do I love what God loves? Do I hate what God hates? Do I love the brethren? Do I have a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there a decreasing pattern of sin in my life? Is there an increasing pattern of holiness? All of these are fruits in keeping with repentance. And if you're not sure of where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to get real honest before God. Confess your sins to him. Cry out to him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to grant you repentance and faith. And if you will truly come to Christ in a humility, in, a, in what the Bible calls a godly sorrow over sin, when you grieve over your sin, 
Not just wanting to escape hell. That's good, and that's right. You should want to escape hell. But just as much as you want a Savior from hell, you should want a Savior from sin. And if you will come to Christ in that godly sorrow over your sin, He will save you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus will not cast you aside if you come to Him in brokenness. Cry out to Him. Place your trust in Christ. He will save you. You will pass from death to life. And that is the good news of the gospel. All right, dear ones, thank you very much for joining us, John. Thank you, brother. Pleasure. Till our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all.